Hey, today we're going to read chapters 18 and 19 of Seraphina and the Twisted Staff by Robert Beatty with the permission of Scholastic, Scholastic as we are continuing with our distance learning. So, here's chapter 18. Seraphina made her way back along the mountain ridge through the thick, scrubby vegetation that grew along, among the rocks, then down the slopes of Greybeard Mountain into the forest trees of the lower elevations. She rested when she needed to, but tried to keep moving. She was determined to find her mother and learn everything she could about the dark force that had invaded the mountains. She had seen the ter terrifying man in the forest with his dogs, and she had come up against Graythen at Biltmore. But she didn't know who or what these men were, or exactly what dark powers they possessed, but she knew she had to fight them. Her mother and the cubs had abandoned the den of the Angel's Glade. So the only clue she had to follow was the cryptic words her mother had scratched into the dirt. If you need me winter, spring, or fall, Seraphina said, come where what you climbed is floor and rain is wall. She imagined it must be a riddle, something she could solve, but their enemies could not. But it confused her. Her mother had wanted her to go back to Biltmore, not follow her. So why did she leave any message at all? As she descended the mountain, she came to a dark stand of decrepit old pine trees with thick, straight trunks coated in black mold. All the lower limbs of the trees withered and rotted, the roots growing along the ground like long, treacherous fingers. The smell of damp earth and rotting wood filled her nostrils. Everything around her was sticky with black pine sap. There were no other plants growing here. No saplings or bushes could survive in the perennial shadow of the blackened pines. Nothing but dark, blood-red pine needles covered the ground. Disturbed by, by this deadened place, she crouched down and tried to see ahead of her through the murky mist of the night. She wondered if there was a path through it or if she had to find a way around it. She could hear the pine sap dripping from the branches of the trees. A foreboding crept into her. On the ground beneath the twisted limbs of the pine trees, she saw a dark, unnatural shape. Her instinct, or her instant urge, no, sorry, her instinct urged her to run, to turn around and go the other direction, put distance between her and whatever this place was, but her curiosity would not let her leave. She crept slowly toward the shape, pulling deep drafts of air into her lungs. It appeared to be a worn, flat, rectangular stone, and beside it a low, elongated, heavy iron cage buried in the ground. She took a hard swallow. She studied the cage, trying to understand what it was for. It was no more than a foot or two high. A small door had been fabricated onto the end of the cage, with a latch on the outside. To lock something in, she thought. It appeared to be the, a cage for a, an animal of some kind. Then she found another cage, and then another. As she crept along, low and quiet, she felt a sickening feeling in her stomach. There were hundreds of cages for as far as she could see. She found a small hut made of twisted branches and gnarly vines. She had seen woodsmen make lean-tos and shelters from branches before, but this shelter did not look like the branches had been cut and gathered, but as if they had grown or slithered into that spot to form walls and roof. The walls and roof. The vines and branches interlaced into an unnatural weave, like the hide of a perverse beast. Pine sap dripped from the tree limbs onto the roof of the hut, coating it in a black and stinking ooze. The gray remnants of a campfire smoldered in front of the hut. A black iron pot sat in the smoking ashes. Dozens of dead crows and vultures lay on the ground, their clawed feet cramped into balls. Seraphina's limbs trembled. Her heart pounded. She was frightened by what she was going to find within this dark place, but she had to find out. She had to keep going. She crept closer to the shelter. She watched and listened. There appeared to be no movement, no sound, other than the constant dripping of the sap. She crept inside. There were bundles of wire inside the foul hut, but no inhabitant. She found wire cutters, gloves, and other tools, but no indication of what all this was for, except for a pile of furred animal skins lying on the hut's dirt floor. Black furs and brown, gray and white. She couldn't help but clench her teeth at the sight of it and snarl her nose away from the rancid smell of dead skin. It felt like spiders were crawling all over her shoulders and neck. She hurriedly backed up out of the hut and scanned the area for danger. She was This was a deeply disturbing place. 
She quickly turned to leave. Then she heard a sound that stopped her in her tracks. A whimper. Now we're moving on to chapter 19. We don't have to stop. Seraphina turned. Back behind the shelter, there were more cages. She heard the whimper again, a long, pleading, mournful whine. As she glanced warily around her, her legs buzzed with tension, her temples pounded. Every sensation in her body was telling her that she should not linger here, but her heart was telling her she must go toward the sound. She crept slowly forward. The other cages had been empty, but to her horror, she found several inhabited cages behind the shelter. She was. She saw brownish fur inside one of the cages, but she still couldn't tell what the creature was. She crept closer. The mound of fur in the cage was a few feet long, and it was shaking. Then she heard the whimpering sound again. Seraphina tried to stay steady and strong, but she started trembling as badly as the poor animal in the cage. She couldn't help it. She looked behind her, then scanned the forest to make sure no one was near. It felt like a terribly dangerous place. The pine trees grew so close together, and the area beneath the upper limbs was so dark that it was difficult to see any distance at all. Crawling on her hands and knees, she crept around to the front of the cage. She peered through the cage's iron bars. There she saw it. Seraphina looked into the face of one of the most beautiful, beautiful animals she had ever seen, a young female bobcat. She had large, striking eyes, long whiskers, and a white marked face with wide ruffs of hair that extended outward from her cheeks and around her head, all the way up to her tufted, black, tipped ears. She had grayish-brown, black, spotted fur, with black streaks on her body and dark bars on her legs. But as beautiful as the bobcat was, she was in terrible shape. It was clear that she'd been drooling and clawing, chewing at the metal cage, frantic to escape. As Seraphina approached her, the bobcat became quiet and still, staring at her with big, round eyes. She seemed to understand that Seraphina was not her enemy. Seraphina saw that there were more animals in the cages. Two, a woodchuck, a porcupine, even a pair of river otters. One of the saddest of all was a red-tailed hawk with its talons lacerated and bloody, its feathers torn and broken from battering its wings against the wire mesh in its fight to escape. Seraphina quickly glanced around her, frightened that the owner of this camp would arrive at any moment. These terrible cages didn't belong to her. She had no right to do what she wanted to do. But did she need someone's permission to do what was right? She looked behind her and then scanned the trees for danger. Her heart began to pound in her chest so hard that she could barely breathe. She knew she should run, but how could she leave? She inched closer to the bobcat's cage, unfastened the latch, and opened the door. Come on out, she whispered. The bobcat crept out slowly, afraid of everything around her. Seraphina touched the cat's fur with her bare hand. The bobcat looked at her with its with her huge eyes, then slunk quickly off into the forest. Once the bobcat had escaped the pine trees and was safely off, um, sorry, in, in the safety of the distant undergrowth, she turned and looked at Seraphina. Thank you, she seemed to be thinking. Then the cat finally made its escape, disappearing into the brush. Stay bold, Seraphina said quietly, remembering the expression the feral boy had used when he helped her. She didn't know why, but for some reason, those two simple words had meant a lot to her. She quickly released the woodchuck, porcupine, and otters. They all looked strong enough to get home. She was sure the otters would know the way to the nearest river, but the hawk was in a bad way. She thought that he could probably fly, but a red red-tailed hawk out at night was in grave danger from its natural enemy, the great horned owl. She reached into the cage, carefully grabbed the hawk with both hands, and pulled him out. He lifted his wings and tried to pull away, none too happy to be handled. She expected that he would hiss and snap at her, but he did not. He stared at her with his powerful raptor eyes and clamped onto her wrist with one of his talons, squeezing so hard that she thought he was going to break her bones. It was as if somehow he somehow understood she wanted to help him, but at the same time, he wasn't going to give up control. She left the pine forest and the terrible cages behind her carrying the wounded hawk clutched in her hands. When she and the hawk had finally escaped the pine trees and entered a better part of the forest, she slowed down. She wished she could carry the hawk all the way back to Biltmore and give it to Brayden to take care of, but she couldn't travel fast enough with the hawk in her hands, and she was pretty sure the hawk wasn't too happy about being carried around by somebody like her. 
She found a safe thicket of tree brush and stuffed the hawk inside, where it could hide from the morending owls until daylight came. Rest here, then fly strong, my friend, she whispered. From there, she tried to move quickly away. She wanted to put as much distance between her and those terrible cages as she could. She knew that the forest was wild, a wild, untamed place with all sorts of life and death struggles. But what kind of person would trap and capture animals like this? Why would he leave them there, starving and afraid, hidden beneath the darkened trees? A mist drifted through the branches of the forest and made it difficult for her to find her way. But she kept moving downhill the best she could. She felt a tightness in her stomach. She couldn't escape the feeling that she had just avoided a dark and terrible danger. Through the mist, she saw something out of the corner of her eye. When she looked over, she spotted a figure in the distance, walking through the trees. At first, she thought it might be the man she'd seen entering the forest with Mr. Vanderbilt. She felt a sudden hope. Maybe she was far closer to Biltmore than she realized. But a heaviness rolled into her chest. She crouched in the underbrush and watched the figure at a distance. He was wearing a long, dark, weather-beaten coat and a wide-brimmed hat. It was the bearded man she'd seen in the forest a few nights before. She hit the dirt in sudden panic. She tried to stay quiet, but her chest pulled in rapid breaths. As she looked toward him, he had, he had a heavy, dark gray beard, not long and scraggly white like many of the mountain men, but thick and wavy like an animal's coat. His face was craggy with cracks and wrinkles, wind-worn like he'd been in the forest for 50 years. She scanned the area looking for signs of the wolfhounds, but didn't see them. Nor did she seem nor did he seem to be carrying the walking stick he had had before. But she knew it was him. Staying low and quiet and very still, she watched him. He seemed to drift into and out of the mist, in and among the trees, disappearing, then reappearing in swirls of the fog. He drifted further away, then closer, as if the trees themselves were playing tricks on her eyes. She seemed, he seemed more like a ghostly haint than an, a mortal man. As she felt the goosebumps rising on her arms, she wanted to run, but she was afraid the sound of her flight would draw his attention. But she had to get out of here. Just as she started to back away and go in the opposite direction, the man stopped dead in his tracks. He pivoted his head toward her with a startling, inhuman quickness, like an owl spotting prey. His terrible silver eyes peered right at her. She ducked down on the ground and pressed her back to the base of a gnarled old fir tree hiding. The image of his pivoting head threw a shiver down her spine. She heard him moving rapidly toward her. She had to run, but her chest tightened and her legs clamped. A sharp pain attacked her throat like someone's fingers had grabbed hold of her windpipe. Her whole body started shaking violently with something beyond fear. Something beyond her control. Panic set in. She couldn't get any air into her lungs. She tried to scream, but she couldn't get a sound of any kind to pass through her constricted throat. The footsteps came rapidly closer as the man in the long, dark coat came toward her. She could hear his boots sinking into the damp earth as he walked. She became aware of a sudden coldness on the ground beneath her and around her. When she looked down, she saw that the earth had become soaked with blood. Dun, dun, dun.